begin in just a minute. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. I think we'll have some other folks trickle in um, as, the, as the session starts. Um, just from, I'll introduce myself a bit and then uh, we'll kind of go to each panelist. We have three wonderful people who will be presenting today and we can have a lot of chat and discussion um, about health departments in the South and how they can support SSPs. Um, so we really wanted to talk about the different ways um, that, you know, obviously laws are very different in every state, even though we're all in the South and um, health departments role in SSPs um, are different. Like they're operated by um, health departments in some areas. They're um, mere, merely <laughs> like, not merely, but like technical assistance or training in some areas or funding. So just talking about the different ways that um, different roles that health departments have with SSP uh, implementation in their states and different ways that um, folks from our panel and the departments they work in have been able to support uh, syringe access programs in their state. Um, and just a little bit about myself and, and work in this area, um, and then I'll move to our panelists. But um, I am excited for this discussion because I was previously someone who worked for like the state government. I'm based in Florida. So previously worked for the um, Department of Health and HIV Prevention Program in Florida and then uh, worked for our state substance use and mental health agency for about five years, um, trying to implement harm reduction within the state government. Um, and so I manage like our naloxone uh, distribution program, doing a lot of training in TA to providers across the state, really trying to get folks on board with harm reduction who, you know, like treatment providers and stuff who, who previously had not uh, been doing that work. Um, our, our syringe access laws in Florida are pretty um, not great, <laughs> um, pretty restrictive. Um, so um, yeah, I'm just excited to, to have this discussion and talk about the different ways that um, even in areas like that where we can you know, support SSPs. Um, so we have on our panel today, we have Allison Wilhelm from uh, the Tennessee Department of Health. Um, we have Sally Baus from the Oklahoma, Oklahoma Department of Health and Amy Patel from the Division of Public Health in North Carolina. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Allison and we'll have each um, panelist can chat for a while and we will open it up for questions um, and discussion. Um, if folks have uh, questions as panelists are presenting, you feel free to write them in the chat. Um, if it's a burning question, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and ask as well. I think we'll have enough time. We have until 3 p.m. Um, and only, you know, we have a smaller panel than, than some of the other sessions that we've had at this conference. So I think we'll have a lot of time for, for discussion. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen and go ahead and turn it over to Allison. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and yes, and to reiterate what Amanda said, um, please feel free to, to jump in at any time um, and unmute yourselves to ask any type of um, questions. All right, can you see, can y'all see my screen? All right, perfect, thank you. So, hey everyone, um, so, super happy to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Allison Wilhelm and I am one of the epidemiologists um, at the HIV Prevention Program at the Tennessee Department of Health. And I also serve as the Syringe Services Program or SSP liaison for the state. Um, so I'm really just going uh, during our session to be talking about how our SSPs have uh, really evolved and grown. So first, um, I'll touch on how our SSPs have evolved since our legislation um, has passed and what our program um, looks like within the state. And then I'll really dive into the ways that uh, TDH HIV prevention program, how we partner with our community-based organizations across the state. Um, and then next I'll talk about how we work with different programs 
within the Department of um, Tennessee Department of Health, but then also across other state agencies, for example, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, um, just in order to en enhance our SSP capacity. And then um, lastly, we'll touch on um, our In This Endemic or ETS uh, Tennessee Initiative and how we prioritize partnering with both internal and external partners working um, to address uh, HIV, STIs, substance use dis disorder, and viral hepatitis um, in, in efforts to bridge gaps across the state. So um, before we dive into the evolution of our state's programs, I really wanted to provide uh, a snapshot of the various resources uh, that Tennessee's SSPs provide. So going from HIV, hepatitis C testing, um, referrals to mental health, um, MAT, MA, MOUD, um, linkage to PrEP, PET, um, and also naloxone distri distribution. So one of our roles as the Department of Health is to really ensure that, our, that the services uh, that are being provided by SSPs are comprehensive enough to meet the community's needs, um, but are also adhering to um, the state legislation, um, which stipulates that th these services that are listed on this slide um, are offered by all TDH um, sanctioned or approved SSPs. So um, in addition to these services, our SSPs also provide um, various services of like uh, for social determinants health. So whether that be housing resources, food assistance, transportation assistance, um, whatever the client's needs, we're just making sure that we're meeting them where they are um, and what in meeting their needs. Um, so on this slide, you will see a timeline that depicts the evolution of Tennessee's SSPs. Uh, since the legislation was first signed into May of 2017. Um, so the legislation had um, several rules within it, uh, but want to point out here that the original law was written um, to allow community-based organizations to provide um, syringe services at least 2,000 feet away from a school or park. So later that year, as you'll see on the timeline, um, the uh, HIV program released a funding opportunity in November of 2017, um, which resulted in four programs receiving funding um, to provide services in Middle and East Tennessee. And in the next slide, you'll see kind of what that looked like geographically across our state. Um, but then in May of 2018, there were a couple amendments passed to the legislation uh, that, that reduced the zoning requirements, excuse me, um, from 2,000 feet from a school or park to 1,000 feet in metro counties. Um, and it also included new language um, that allowed local health departments as well um, to operate SSPs with the approval of the local governing body. Um, so subsequently, um, in, during 2019 to early 2021, uh, five additional programs um, joined the uh, SSP network, if you will, in Tennessee. And so you can kind of see this snapshot right here. So um, these two maps illustrate the expansion that I described um, on the previous slide. So you'll notice here that in 2018, um, those four first programs um, were really situated in metro areas, um, but we now have several sites that have expanded into rural um, areas into Northeast Tennessee, which we've really wanted to focus on. And then also, which is super exciting, um, we now have three SSPs in Shelby County or Memphis, which is in the Southwest corner um, of our state, um, which is also an ending the HIV epidemic uh, priority jurisdiction. So we're super, um, you know, excited for the growth um, that we've had and hopefully more to come. 
So now here I am going to talk about um, the role of the HIV prevention program and how we support the SSPs and what our role looks like within the state, right? So our program really coordinates the application submission, review and approval process. So I'm kind of the first set of eyes, if you will, on the application. And then once I kind of get a, um, a good gauge on it, I'll hand it over to our HIV prevention or our HIV program director and our medical director who will then send it over to the commissioner for um, final review. So um, our program also allocates funding and work with, uh, we work with other sections and efforts to support our community-based um, SSPs. So myself and our HIV program director, um, we also, this is um, kind of new, but we began facilitating uh, new program orientation upon SSP approval, um, which really just allows us the opportunity to provide any type of um, information that a program may need to feel comfortable and confident um, in operating a new program, as well as provides them a space to ask us the questions um, that they may have before um, beginning any type of operations. Um, whether that may be if they need any type of TA or technical assistance or anything like that. Um, and so then also we um, offer, so myself and two other co-facilitators, um, we provide quarterly harm reduction trainings, um, which really focuses on both harm reduction and SSP practices. Um, so all are welcome to join across the state um, whether that be from a community-based organization or a health department, um, either or, um, or with like local health department or within this, the state department. Um, so we have transitioned to a virtual training setting due to the pandemic. Um, as much as we love seeing folks in person and we miss it, um, I guess the, the positive, on, on a positive note, um, being in a virtual setting has also allowed the opportunity to um, be able to train a lot more folks. Um, and then lastly, but not least, so we're also um, here to provide any type of technical assistance, as I was just saying, to our program. So whether that may look like our scheduled uh, monthly calls that we um, host uh, with the TDH funded programs, as well as we host an all SSP call to provide a space for announcements, presentation, peer networking, or any type of data uh, uh, guidance on data collection and best practices um, and ensuring that you know the data that our programs are um, requiring of the people that they serve doesn't necessarily deter folks from receiving um, their services. All right, so here, this is just kind of a little visual. I'd really uh, just like to point out how many agencies and departments are essential in coordinating our efforts to support SSPs and really making them sustainable across the state. Um, that's what's important to us. So beyond our HIV prevention program, we work super closely with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Um, our viral hepatitis program is essential. The, um, the, our overdose response coordination office is also critical um, to our programs, along with our friends at the Office of Informatics and Analytics. Uh, so this all is to ensure that our programs are equipped with all of the resources that they need in order to thrive and to be able to, um, to provide the services for their clients to meet their needs. Um, so now that I kind of gave like a quick overview um, at uh, which programs we kind of work together with in order to support our SSPs, um, I'm going to kind of take a review as to um, look at the different services that each program provides so that we can make sure and coordinate, collaborate that this all works, right? So each program has their own set of supplies, uh, materials, human resources, data support, all of that stuff that they offer to the SSPs. So um, just quick example, uh, the HIV or HIV and hepatitis C um, test kits 
and related supplies for testing are provided in kind by the HIV prevention and viral hepatitis programs. Um, and the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services um, has been a critical partner to all of our SSPs in providing naloxone in kind to our um, programs. Um, the Tennessee Department of Health Overdose Response and Coordinate, Coordination Office, or ORCO as we call it, um, they have peer navigators um, that are placed in what um, the program or the division calls um, high impact areas or HIAs um, for uh, overdose prevention. And then um, the viral hepatitis program um, has strategically placed harm reduction resource team nurses and health departments across the state um, to support linkage to harm reduction services for persons who are vulnerable to uh, HCV. So, and then our data support um, is uh, ongoing across, um, across all programs and um, to assess um, and understand where we are most vulnerable to injection drug related HIV and hepatitis C outbreaks along biweekly, we also have biweekly meetings that um, where we meet to track um, overdose reporting um, out of in our uh, Office of Informatics and Analytics um, facilitates those meetings and takes the lead on that. So um, here, now I will start talking about the, in this endemic, uh, Tennessee or ETS, um, which is a statewide community driven strategic planning process um, to jointly address HIV, STIs, substance use disorder, and viral hepatitis. Um, this initiative is led by Amber Coyne, who I believe is maybe on this call. So you have you all have or in this session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, to ask. Um, and it was launched in 2020. And um, it has really enhanced our collaboration between state agencies um, and with community-based service providers across the state. Um, so there's several highlights as a result of ETS. And um, as it relates to syringe services programs. And so um, it has really resulted in increasing um, regional and statewide networking between state department and community partners. Um, this is amazing. There are over 375 and counting um, people that are registered for um, for regional planning groups, rep, which also represent over 193 unique organizations and programs. And so the planning, the, this planning process and this initiative has really allowed the opportunity to produce um, two guidance documents to support the development of evidence-based SSPs. And, and also through these efforts, um, we really, um, have made a focus and have worked on to combat stigma through language guidance doc through a language guidance document and um, a language guidance uh, workshop, which has um, resulted in over 200 people being trained statewide. So um, it's really provided addition. And ETS has also provided an additional uh, funding and expansion for SSPs in Tennessee. So through this process and the ETS pilot projects, um, they were, we were also able to fund two outreach and navigation staff at SSPs, as well as fund one group of um, sexual health and substance use uh, clinics to partner with their SSP. So this is really exciting work that's going on here. And then lastly, um, just a quick snapshot. So on this slide, you'll see some of the um, key programs um, or key program outcomes since um, program operations began. Um, and so it's really important to note here though, that the data here is only represents the data that we receive from TDH funded SSPs. 
But, um, you know, as a result of our evolution um, in partnerships from 2018 through 2021, our programs have really grown substantially all around. Um, and I think that's the key um, takeaway from this slide, um, including from the amount of people being served with the number of syringes being um, collected and returned, also um, the number of naloxone kits being distributed. So, I mean, as you can see here, our programs are distributing 16 times more naloxone from 2018 to 2021, and six times more syringes um, are also being distributed. So this is just um, amazing work that are done um, from our programs. And um, I think it's also worth to note that this is all being done um, despite of the pandemic that we're still all um, experiencing. So um, huge shout out to our SSBs. And that's it. So thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I am open to any and all questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, and I know that Amber uh, from Tennessee as well has posted some things in the chat uh, with more information, uh, links with more information to the End the Syndemic Initiative in Tennessee, uh, if folks want to check those out as well. Um, and I have some questions that I was thinking of, of asking, but I think I'll just wait until um, until all panelists have gone just about like feedback from, from programs you provide support to and stuff like that. So for now, yeah, of course. Um, yeah so for now I'll turn it over to um, Sally from Oklahoma. And I believe you have slides as well, if you want to share your screen. Awesome, thank you. Oh, I think you're on mute, Sally. <laughs> have to hit every button right at the first time. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Sally Baus. I'm the Administrative Programs Manager of Prevention and Intervention for the Oklahoma State Department of Health. This is one of my favorite conferences. I just love this conference because I learned so much. I have been with the Oklahoma State Department of Health for 25 years and wrote my first thing around syringe service programs approximately about 23 years ago working with the Oklahoma Medical Association and am pleased to say that last year we finally had a bill that passed for syringe services. And so I'm going to talk about that first and I think that Oklahoma really won the, the lottery here on our bill because I think it is it is very open and we don't have a lot of restrictions. One thing that this bill does not do is it's a harm reduction services bill. It is not a syringe services bill. It's not mentioned in that way hardly at all. So it is it fits within our, paraf our drug paraphernalia laws in Oklahoma. And what this law does is it does, what I have underlined here, pro it provides an exception that authorizes certain entities to engage in harm reduction services. Um, they're required to register with us at the Oklahoma State Department of Health and providing for certain allowable activities, providing reporting requirements, directing rules, providing for cod codification and declaring an emergency. So under this bill, the definition that they chose for harm reduction services is uh, programs established to reduce the spread of infectious disease related to injection drug use, reduce drug dependency, overdose deaths, and associated complications, and uh, increase safe recovery and disposal of used syringes and sharp waste. So we think that we've, we've really got lucky in that there's almost nobody that can't do it. Um, the folks that can are government entities, Religious institution, nonprofits, for profits, non governmental entities partnering with the government agency and tribal governments. So we really don't have any restrictions. I can fit just about anybody into that particular definition of who can be a provider. They have to register with us. Um, 
And that falls under the sexual health and harm reduction um, part of the service, our service at the health department. And then they can engage in harm reduction services as outlined and um, they have to just stay within the laws. This is another bunch of writing that I'm not gonna read all this to you and I don't want you to read it all. I'm just trying to showing you this that shows you the example of that the law is really very, very short. Um, they had, you know, tells them what they have to do in their application for uh, registration. It tells them their quarterly reporting requirements to the health department. And um, then it lays out exactly what they can do. Those that are providing these harm reduction services offer referrals and resources to treat substance use disorders, provide education on the risk of transmission of infectious diseases, including HIV, viral hepatitis, rapid testing for HIV, hep C, and sexually transmitted infections, referrals for medical and mental health services, collect used hypodermic needles for safe disposal, possess and distribute hypodermic needles, cleaning kits, test kits, and opioid antagonists, and rapid substance testing products used intended for use or fashioned specifically for the use of identifying or analyzing the potency or toxicity of, known, of unknown substances. And that's it. That's, that's our law. So it's, it, I think it came out really non-restrictive compared to other states. Um, so this is what we have to work within. We haven't started yet. We are currently in the process of, we have written the rules. We went through that whole process. The rules um, currently, even under an emergency in Oklahoma, those rules do not take effect until September of 2022. Well, when we saw that, we were not too happy that we were gonna have to wait even longer. So now we are working on a process where we're going to go ahead and be able to kick off the program and um, before September. So we're looking at our services to start hopefully mid-March or the beginning of April that will be able to kick everything off. And so I really wanted to talk about how did we get this done in Oklahoma? Because starting 23 years ago, and then we had a bill come up the year before it passed and with COVID hit and everything, and it just did ne never got heard in 2020. So there's been a whole lot of people working behind the scenes and working on the bill. And um, we've had lots of involvement from our, we have the Oklahoma HIV and Hepatitis Planning Council. That's our CPG. We also have another separate panel for um, ending, for getting, uh, for hepatitis that works on the hepatitis plan as well. These folks have really come together. We've worked with all of our local health departments, our state health departments. We brought in all kinds of community folks. We brought in business leaders. We brought in FQHCs. Um, one interesting thing and person that we never expected to hear from was the Grand River Dam Authority. And if you didn't know it in Oklahoma, we actually do have big giant shipping channels and are a uh, large part of some shipping that goes on across the United States. And the Grand River Dam Authority, they, they are in charge of that dam and they do some stuff with electric production and different things like that. So I was really surprised when their executive director showed up at a meeting about syringe services and hepatitis elimination. That was really surprise. And so I really got to talking to him and I, and I just, I was honest, I told him that. I said, I'm real surprised you're here. What brings you to our meeting? And this was one of our strongest, strongest people that really had a lot to say. And he said, because injection drug use and hepatitis C is affecting my employees. I have employees that have hep C that need cured. 
and different things. And so it is, it is affecting our employees and our business. So we reached out and got, you know, he brought other friends to the table. And this was our primary group that worked together, the FQHC folks, some different policy organizations statewide. When we were working on that legislation with the legislators that uh, put it together, but our, our planning body did a whole lot. We created lots of materials for legislators and made sure that those got in their hands and for the community as well. We really trained our planning group to become experts in talking about syringe service programs, harm reduction, and why they're, why they're needed in Oklahoma. We created syringe support cards that people could fill out that card and then send that to their legislator. We also made lots of legislator calls because that's what our CPG can do for us. Those are the folks that can take care of some of my limitations. Um, and we made sure that there were lots of calls. And also, I, I think what's really important when we're, when we're talking about harm reduction and syringe services is uh, talk about it all the time. That, that's one thing that I think really, really benefited us is that we talked about it all the time. Working on your out of office connections. You know, I can tell you after five o'clock that I don't always, that stuff becomes personal for Sally after five o'clock. And Sally does things that, and contacts people to talk to them about how she feels personally as Sally Bouse that has nothing to do with the health department. Um, you can really build lots of, it's important to build those relationships with even your own legislators. You know, when somebody hits our front porches, we talk to them, we, we coach our CPG and everybody about how to talk to them about things that are legislatively important and things that are important in Oklahoma and that our community cares about different things like that. So always talk, talk, talking about what's going up, what's going on, what you're doing and talking to your own legislators in your own time because you can use your own expertise and you can use your own time off the clock as a citizen, not as a health department employee, but as an individual citizen, as Sally citizen, I'm really concerned about hepatitis C in Oklahoma. So surprise encounters. This is something that could not have happened to me at a better time. And when we were sitting around and we were getting our COVID shots, when they were first starting to, to get us to vaccinate for COVID, and that kind of thing. And you guys that know me and my NASTED friends know that Sally's never met a stranger. I, I will talk to everybody. So I'm sitting in line, I've got my COVID, my first COVID vaccine. And the guy looking, sitting next to me, he looks familiar. And so I just ask him, cause I'm that way. I'm like, you look familiar, who are you? And so he told me his name and it just happened that he was the governor's general counsel. And he, I recognized him because he used to be part of legal at the health department, but there I am, all of a sudden, I have the governor's legal counsel sitting next to me at the time that a syringe service harm reduction bill has just passed, or is, get, is working on getting passed, and then it will go to the governor's office for signature. So those are the kind of surprise encounters that you really, really need to take advantage of. I sat there and I said, oh my gosh, I am so glad that I've met you then because there's some really important legislation that's moving through the legislature right now around harm reduction and syringe programs. And it's important because Oklahoma is estimated to be highest for hep C only behind DC, which really makes us the number one state for hepatitis C. So have those, have your, have your talking points ready at all times. Be ready for those surprise encounters or who you might meet by accident that can really support your program and who can help. Other people that I've talked to about this, my buddy, Nathan. 
my buddy Nathan um, is a homeless fella that lives not too far from my house. And he hangs around the same taco truck that I go to. And I talk to Nathan a lot. And I, I talked to Nathan. I said, Nathan, we're, we're getting ready to kick off syringe services in Oklahoma. You ever heard about that? And he goes, oh, yeah, that's where you can go get clean needles if you, if you shoot up and stuff. And I said, yeah, exactly. So what do I need to do in Oklahoma in order for people to come to our program? Nathan, I found my street experts. Nathan said I needed to get a van, I needed to come around, I needed to be at the same spot at the same time on the same day, bring a little food or something for folks to eat and different things like that. So, you know, I've learned over my 25 years that I learn the most from the folks that we serve. And so it's really important that we do have those folks um, in our programs, working in our programs. And um, I've just been so excited about a lot of the stuff today. Also, what's really helped us, and I have to give big giant props and a giant shout out to SHOTS. SHOTS stands for Stop Harm on Tulsa Streets. Some of the bravest, best Oklahomans I know, and they have been doing syringe services for a few years. They did it before the law passed. They talked to their local sheriff, the mayor, the chief of police, different folks like that about what they wanted to do. And they were supported in, by those people because we're, we're taking the needles off the street that, that those folks get poked with. So they were very supported in their local area they jumped out there, they started syringe services in Oklahoma and have been very successful. And I think having that to talk about with legislators too, that we already have people that have been doing this, it's successful, you haven't heard about it. So that means that it hasn't caused any problems or disruptions in any communities. And so SHOTS really did a whole lot to, uh, get syringe services, they, they had the bravery to step up and get syringe services visible in Oklahoma. So now what we're working on is we've got our data collection system running. We have, we're just getting ready to start up with that registration process and um, get things going. At this time, our federal, you know, with federal laws and state laws, there's, there's restrictions on can't buy syringes. Um, we're currently working closely with, uh, I'm working closely with one tribe that I know within their tribe, they additionally to the Oklahoma law passed a law within their tribal laws to allow this within their nation. And so it's going to be very interesting to see, I know of organizations that are gonna register and step up and provide these services right away. We have our, our contracted organizations that we expect, but I'm really excited to see how the tribes pick up on this. Of course, um, we can expect uh, Cherokee Nation will be the lead. And that is because of Dr. Jorge Mira. I think that they'll probably have that going within Cherokee Nation very soon. And I'm real excited about that. So we're just getting ready to that kickoff spot. So we're getting to a really exciting but nervous space to be. Um, I please encourage you to reach out. This is, this is who I am in my email. We also have a great website that I encourage you guys to look at. It's endingHIVOklahoma.org. This is our uh, EHE site that you can land. It's where you can, um, people from Oklahoma can order condoms and have them mailed to their house. They can order the HIV at home testing. Also, we have tons of videos that also meet all the EHE priorities and talk about Oklahoma specific programs and anything like that. And again, I welcome any questions you may have at the end. So 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Sally. That was um, a really nice overview of what's going on in Oklahoma, a place that I will uh, be honest, I uh, don't know much about. Um, just want to echo a few things. Definitely, uh, it's funny. It's such a fine line, especially when working um, like for a, a state government or something when it comes to talking with legislators. Um, uh, I've, I've walked that line many times. <laughs> um, and even as a citizen, like, you know, not being a registered lobbyist, but it's like, hey, I'm just here to educate you about this issue. And oh, by the way, there's also this bill that is moving through the legislature and here are all the ways that like it would help with this issue without being like you need to vote yes on this thing. <laughs> um, there are very creative ways to do that or not even that creative. Um, Invite your legislators to your neighborhood picnics. That's a good one too. Um, and then just echoing frustrations with um, restrictions on funding. Um, so it sounds like in your state law as well, they can't buy syringes with it. Um, I know in Florida, um, like uh, our, our legislation is that no state, city or county funds can go to um, the operation of SSPs, which is like a vague statement. So it's not just a restriction on syringes. I think they tried to compromise with just getting a restriction on purchasing syringes um however it's pretty much that like they can't be supported by program or by state city or county funds uh which is super super frustrating um especially just with all of the requirements um of those programs through the law um in terms of referrals and uh distributing naloxone and distributing syringes but like oh you can't have any funding to do this so there are some creative ways around that as well uh, certainly partnering with like uh, local health departments has been helpful to like provide HIV testing kits or, or some other things. Um, when I worked for the state and I think still currently they're able to get free naloxone from the state, which is like not, you know, technically a part of their, I mean, it's a part of their SSP, but you know, um, it's not distributing syringes. So just finding like other ways to, to provide those services um, with funds that can support those programs, um, but it, it, it is frustrating. <laughs> um, so I'm going to now move to Amy Patel from North Carolina, and I believe you have um, a presentation as well if you'd like to share your screen. Yes, I do, thank you. Give me just one second. Sorry. And again, if folks have um, questions throughout the presentation, you can put them in the chat, or if you want to share experiences that you've had uh, in your state, whether you're with a health department or an SSP um, and ways that you feel like your health department could better support your program um, or anything that you wanted to share. And I'll hand it over to Amy. Thank you. And um, can you see everything okay? Yep. Awesome. So I'm Amy Patel. I work for the North Carolina Division of Public Health, um, and I help lead our overdose prevention team, which is based in the injury and violence prevention branch. So I like to start off um, highlighting the awesome team I work with because we're, I would say we're a pretty large team, um, even though we, I feel like we're kind of buried in um, under the state Department of Health and Human Services. So we have a fun slide to describe everyone. Um, so just going kind of in the, from the first row, Colin Miller helps lead um, our technical assistance around certain service programs and post overdose response teams. He had co-founded a certain service program um, in Winston-Salem um, and then joined our team full-time last year after working part-time. So we're excited to have him. Um, Alyssa Kitlis, she helps lead um, and coordinate our various technical assistance efforts um, across different partners and leads the North Carolina Safer Syringe Initiative, which I'll talk about later. Um, we have Margaret Bordeaux, who is our Justice Involved Program Specialist. Um, I've started to give little bios about each person, but I'll just keep it moving just for time. Um, we have Amanda Isaac, who's trained both in public health and as a pharmacist, who um, is our naloxone specialist and coordinates our different clinical and healthcare partnerships. 
We have Megan Smith, who serves as a program and contracts coordinator and helps work closely with the local health department um, and uh, their associated partners that we funded. We have Allison Gunn, who's our evaluator um, and keeps us on top of grants uh, reporting. Um, we have Nidal Krom, who is part-time and helps with developing a few key training materials. We have Kanisha Rogers, who's also part-time and works to support Margaret on Justice Involved programs. We have me. Um, and then we have Joe Prater, who's also part-time um, as a Justice Involved consultant who comes um, from the State Department of Public Safety. So um, it kind of complements Margaret and Kanisha in focusing on the jail side, and Joe focuses more on the state prison side. Um, I don't plan to read a lot of all of this, but I just wanted to have this overview slide to show kind of the breadth of the kind of technical assistance and support we try to offer related to overdose uh, prevention and harm reduction. Um, I am gonna focus the rest of the presentation on certain service programs, but just wanted to note um, kind of the different programs and offerings that we have um, focused on our 24 uh, grantees that are through the local health departments, but include community-based organizations. Um, the registered certain service programs, different jail-based and justice-involved initiatives, of course, the usual webinar development, training academies, toolkit development, handouts. Um, we work with our data and epi team to keep track of where um, you see more overdoses occurring and try to provide more support where you can. And of course, supporting naloxone distribution and clinical and healthcare related technical assistance. Um, so the first chunk I'll focus on are our state and local certain service program partnerships and technical assistance. Um, as others have mentioned, we all have varying laws on how um, SSPs were legalized um, for North Carolina. It was legalized in the summer of 2016. Um, and similar to uh, uh, what one of you mentioned, our law is fairly open as well um, in that any government or non-government organization um, can open and register with us, the Division of Public Health, to operate a certain service program. Um, and it also provides limited immunity and for protections um, related to drug paraphernalia or injection equipment um, for employees, volunteers, and participants. Um, and so relatedly, it's the Division of Public Health that helps manage the North Carolina Safer Syringe Initiative. So this is just a screenshot um, of our website. And if you're curious, you can always Google any of these websites or I'm glad to put any in the chat afterwards. Um, I'll be talking through a few different resources with different links. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about what the registration process looks like uh, for SSPs, um, you have to provide the key components of any SSPs SSP, including distributing syringes um, and other supplies, um, including naloxone, offering a way to dispose of the syringe, whether that's education or providing biohazard containers, um, and other health education related to overdose and infectious disease prevention, um, and offering referrals to different substance use treatment, mental health, and other social or health needs that folks have. Um, another requirement is they have to develop, programs have to develop a safety plan that is shared with local law enforcement um, and give them a heads up that, you know, this, we're operating, so don't create problems for us, please. But unfortunately, we still hear those sort of stories. Um, and you have to develop a participant card to make sure you can get that limited immunity um, protection from the law. Um, and there is an annual reporting requirement to our team at the Division of Public Health um, we try to keep it focused on a few key metrics and over time have added a few optional sections um, just to try to collect a little bit more demographic info, but really try to keep the core required parts um, to, the requ to the true required pieces um, that are needed by covering the, the previous items noted below of number of supplies distributed and all that. Um, and of course, we continue to provide technical assistance to new and existing programs. Um, on the right, you can see a sample participant card from North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and then just uh, bottom right is a screenshot of a resource that was developed in partnership with local SSPs on um, considerations during hurricanes and storms um, and making sure that the risk of overdoses don't increase, which unfortunately usually do during um, natural disasters. So this is just a quick overview of our latest numbers. Um, from the reporting period of summer 2020 to last summer 2021. Um, we 
from that report, we had 42 registered SSPs, but since then, since that was last summer, we're now at 46 certain service programs. Um, so we continue to grow. Um, and as of that report, 56 of the 100 North Carolina counties were directly served um, with, uh, sorry, um, in addition to one federally recognized tribe, there uh, is an SSP um, with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians um, that is run. And so we're excited that they're able to have their own program too. Um, and additionally, people from 27 additional counties have been served um, by traveling to any of those counties that are directly offering services, um, in addition to having people from three other states, neighboring states, including Tennessee, um, come to receive services. And we imagine they're usually, you know, probably on the border side. And this just gives kind of a visual of the counties that are directly served and those that are indirectly served. And so this helps provide um, a visual to show that most of the state is reached um, by one SSP or another. Um, and you can see here a list of the different type of organizations um, that are running SSPs, um, community-based organizations, some local health departments, um, a few faith-based organizations, and a few health system treatment providers, aid service organizations, um, a couple of first responders, and several people who are, you know, kind of kind of doing it from their backyard or their trucks or whatever. Um, and have really developed a strong program. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few key numbers from our last report. Um, so you can kind of see the increase over time um, in, the, in, in, in the sense of individuals served in total context by SSPs. So if you're not familiar with the language, um, unique individuals is really getting at the person, um, not double counting them, while number of contacts would be like I served the same person five times. Um, so you wanna count that five along with however many times you had interactions with other people um, because you could be possibly having lower individual people that you reach out to, but a high number of contacts that you're making. And of course we wanna capture that impact as well. And I think that's really important, um, especially because it speaks to relationship building as well. Um, so compared to the last reporting year, we had an increase of 73% of unique people that were reached. Um, and then in terms of the total context, we had an increase of 32%. Um, for supply distribution in the last reporting year, um, SSPs collectively distributed over 8 million syringes, which was an increase of over 42, or sorry, 52% from the previous year. And again, you can kind of see that um, general increase over time. And then for naloxone kits um, distributed almost 90,000 kits in the last reporting year, which is an increase of almost 70% from the previous year. Um, and then in terms of reported reversals, a little over 12,000, and that's an increase of over 43%. Um, and of course, we know that's likely to be an underestimate because um, many aren't getting reported back to the SSP. So, you know, we do the best you can with the numbers you have. So a lot of info on this slide, but the main thing is, that we wanted to highlight how another way we've provided support in THU SSPs is being able to purchase eligible um, harm reduction supplies um, for SSPs directly. And so this was through CDC funding and the type of items where um, hygiene, wound care, um, so it can be sterile waters, bandages, um, the triple antibiotic cream like Neosporin basically, um, and those kinds of items that certain service programs usually keep um, in stock and those are allowed um, to purchase because they're not syringes even though we know that's the top most needed item um, we try to do the best we can and it does seem like it has been impactful to provide support because then local programs can use any savings they had from not having to buy these other types of supplies to then purchase um, syringes themselves and so we first had um, our supply purchasing kind of pilot, if you will, um, in early 2019. And since then we've had a few rounds, including when COVID-19 um, started and the stay at home orders were issued. Um, we got an exemption to make sure that any of the, of the ex extra supplies that we had just slowly been distributing got all distributed out ASAP because we just knew, we had already been hearing from programs that the need was gonna increase, but it's gonna be challenging um, to distribute supplies. So. I think that's, I think I might've spoken a little bit on that at last year's Institute, so I didn't wanna to focus too much on that. 
Um, but that that was a way that um, our team helped provide support during the pandemic um, to SSPs. Um, one issue I'll note because we are touching on a little bit of funding pieces is we we have been doing this through our carryover funding from CDC, um, the carryover that kind of comes in after um, all the numbers and everything are finalized or liquidated or whatever the terms are, um, because it's an easy way to spend that money without having to take the time to do a full on contract. Um, and unfortunately this last year, um, I guess it's good and bad, but we didn't have that kind of second round of carryover. And so um, we're trying to see how can we do another round of supply purchasing um, this year, because I think I wouldn't say programs have gotten dependent on it, but programs are interested in knowing whether we can provide that support because, of course, um, it's helpful. And so that has been a bit of a barrier because we haven't written it proactively as a standing line. But I think that's something we might move towards doing in the future. Um, and so just some photos to show what the supply distribution process looks like, um, like to highlight, you know, some photos and some of the programs and partners and staff that helped do that. Most of those boxes are sterile waters, but there's other things like alcohol wipes um, and biohazard containers. So shifting to naloxone distribution, um, with the CDC overdose data to action funding, we can't purchase naloxone, but we've now developed a really good partnership with the sister agency or Division of Mental Health, um, who can purchase naloxone. And um, Amanda on our team works with them to do the allocations and has slowly gotten them to purchase more intramuscular vials, which are more cost effective um, than the nasal, um, to, to you know, obviously distribute further and more widely um, and make sure SSPs are getting um, the amount of naloxone that they're requesting. We usually survey um, everyone to make sure we're getting a sense of need and making sure um, everyone who needs it is getting it and at the appropriate quantities. And so you'll see, um, I guess I can skip to our 2021 numbers of nearly 120K um, vials of the IM naloxone and then a little over 76K of the nasal spray. Oops, that was a photo, so it took a second. Um, and so this is just some of the photos from the naloxone distribution. And so we've just had, so far we've just had um, mostly the supplies shipped to our public health warehouse storage and coordinated with programs to do pickups and anyone who wasn't able to do pickups, which was was just a small percentage um, that we did direct to drop offs our staff um, just went to their program. Um, so that's how we've tried to be efficient, but I think in the next round we might try to do some direct shipments. That was kind of the model we did the first time, but it was kind of a hassle to confirm receipts and all that kind of stuff. So you kind of got to make sure you have an understanding of what logistically would work to you for your program. Um, and so here's a copy of the naloxone request form. So now we just keep um, a request form uh, live year round. Um, because it sounds like our sister agency division of mental health has um, regularly available at least the nasal naloxone um, of Narcan. And so we're at least trying to be proactive and getting a sense of request and trying to monitor it regularly. And similarly for report, reporting reversals in naloxone distribution, we have a survey up on our naloxonesaves.org website um, for that. So another, shifting a little bit, another example of partnerships and supports that we have um, is we have an advisory group um, with people from SSPs and other people with lived experience. Um, and this has been in place, I should have written the year, but I wanna say since around 2017, 2018, um, it was created as part of the state action plan, the very first version of it. And we meet monthly and it's been a great way to share even draft RFA proposals, see what's feasible, get feedback, um, get input, hear local priorities, check in. Um, and that's been a really great and effective um, resource that we have. And I know I'm going a little over on time, so I will try to wrap it up. Um, but I have a few more slides. So our next section is community training and collaboration. So um, I've noted in parentheses where we've contracted with different folks just to kind of highlight what parts um, we've directly paid for and which parts are partnerships. For the advisor group, we haven't found a great way to compensate folks yet um, through our bureaucratic channels. Um, so that part is 
um, people just using their own staff time from their programs. Um, but with North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition, we've had um, a contract with them for many years now. And some of the key activities we do with them include co-hosting a quarterly learning collaborative meeting. So those are usually day long or at least a good chunk of the day um, where we kind of identify priority topics to do a deeper dive on, um, share best practices, share any issues that may be happening um, and do a lot of that peer learning. Um, and then of course we support um, NCHRC and their TA efforts. And we just have a few numbers highlighted there. Um, I know I'm running over on time, so I'm gonna try to go quickly. Um, so we have this training opportunity, what we call the Injury Free Harm Reduction Academy. Um, snapshot of some of the topics that are covered there. I'll share a copy of slides later. Um, we had pivoted from focusing on the nuts and bolts of starting up an SSP to um, harm reductions principles and practices. And I would say these are better for those just kind of in the early stages of getting into harm reduction. And so it's an intensive training opportunity, kind of better understand what harm reduction is like. We have this other initiative that's a regional effort um, with Appalachian region states um, that's in partnership with UNC Chapel Hill Injury Prevention Research Center. It's a really awesome initiative. They do a great job being very, um, I guess, participant driven and having awesome newsletters and having pretty cool on agenda, like discussion groups and meetings. Um, so just wanted to give them a shout out. And I don't think we have time to talk about funding processes, but in case we did, I had thrown in a few slides. Um, this is just a graphic from our state action plan, getting into the priorities, basically talking about in more detail, some of the funding we provided to local health departments, but asking them, encouraging them to partner with different community-based organizations and other partners. This is a quick visual map of the different strategies that were chosen timeline, number of programs, just kind of getting through the timeline and kind of how we leverage our bureaucracy. And what I mean by that is it takes a lot less time to fund local health departments than to do individual contracts with community-based organizations. Um, and so that's why we went through the local health departments and really encouraged them to subcontract um, with CBOs. And then over time, last year was the first time we were able to directly fund eight community-based organizations and kind of take the time to do all that grounding paperwork, all of that good stuff. And so we were pretty excited and proud of that. Um, and I think that's basically it. So just kind of that whole feedback loop that we try to have with the state and local partners. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. That was uh, an awesome presentation. Um, yeah, so if folks um, have things to share uh, based on their experience in their states or, or how they work with SSPs or if you work with, um, or if you work for an SSP or anything like that, please feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. I do have some um, questions as well. So I will just go ahead and start, but if um, folks have other thoughts to share, please put them uh, in the chat or, or speak up. Um, I did kind of want to ask about, so you had talked about um, like just from a community advisory board, you know, type perspective. Um, and I'm glad that you had mentioned that. And that has been something if folks have attended other sessions uh, during this SSP Institute that has been talked about and ways to really like meaningfully compensate folks, um, you know, it would be nice to just give people cash uh, for their time. And Sally, I thought of it as well when you were talking about um, this person that you know gave you really good ideas, almost from like a consultant perspective on ways to to operate um, SSPs. So I kind of just wanted, I, Amy. I know you mentioned like you guys are trying to figure out ways to um, to to compensate folks uh, for their time and and their expertise. Um, so if you or Allison or Sally have thought about, um, I know there are challenges, you know, just within like bureaucracy in general for, for a lot of things, but have you come up with any, any solutions or what are you guys leaning towards or, um, you know, just how that process is going? We haven't come up with great solutions. We are doing them virtually now. So at least there's no travel expense, um, but yeah, unfortunately we haven't figured that out, but it's on our to-do list. <laughs> what are like the, the challenges you faced with that that have restricted it, I guess? I guess we don't, we haven't figured out the right 
sorry, I'm like trying to keep myself from getting too bureaucratic. Um, I should probably inquire about our gift card process because we learn a lot about contractors providing gift cards, but I think for us to directly do it, there's a few more steps involved. Um, we have a few other mechanisms to pay people for like one-time things like conference presentations and that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's just tricky for something recurring. We haven't figured out um, a regular process in that way. And I see Sally unmuting, so I'm make sure you get some time too. We haven't really figured out a good process either, but some things that we are looking at is we do fund, um, one, one advantage we have is we are HIV, STIs, viral hepatitis, and our own surveillance department all together. So we don't have to go reach out to a lot of different folks. And then also our injury department works with this because those are the folks that ha are, have access to the naloxone money and some, some uh, different things like that. I've bought my friend Nathan a lot of tacos at the taco truck, funding them by Sally funds. But we're looking at, you know, how can our funded CBOs maybe provide that easier because they are able to get their hands on gift cards or different things like that. Another thing we're looking at is we have the ability to hire people through a temporary service. The only barrier that we're hitting there really though is, you know, how they get paid. If they are gonna pay them with the check or do you have to have automatic deposit and, and things like that. So that's where the barrier that we're gonna to have to, to figure out how with our temporary agency maybe a place that you know we can work with a place for them to get their checks cashed or something like that at no cost because a place knows that it that it is from a good place and if i my former career was in um <laughs> i have some connections to companies that cash checks for people so i'm hoping to find one of those type of agencies that we could deal with that would uh you know, give those folks their money because we've ran into that with our community planning group as well. When we try to get our consumers involved and stuff like that, we can pay for their travel expenses, but at the end they get a check or they get something, you know, deposited into a bank account. And that's what happens at the, that we really have got to work against from the legislative through the, to our own particular upper leadership that, you know, we're all functional folks pretty well, I, that's kind of a mostly functional folks. And um, we have bank accounts and stuff like that. They not work with the population that doesn't have bank accounts and different abilities and stuff like that to navigate different systems. So that's definitely something we're still looking at too, is how can we get money into people's hands that don't have bank accounts or things like that to help us serve our populations. So I think also, um, no, thank you both Amy and Sally. That's amazing input. Also, um, Amber Coyne, who leads our In This Endemic um, efforts uh, that I was uh, mentioning during our presentation, uh, hopefully not putting her too much on the spot, but I think she might have some great input in this conversation. Yeah, so we really wanted to ensure that folks involved in, in this endemic strategic planning process were compensated for their time and their expertise that they're bringing into these meetings. Ultimately, that feedback is really going to guide programs, including certain service programs over the next several years. Um, and so in lieu of being able to provide actual lunches in in-person meetings, which is what we used to do in the past for strategic planning, um, we wanted to provide them with something. So we actually tap into our lead uh, grant agent for HIV prevention. And um, so I run attendance lists from all of our virtual meetings. I send that over their way, and then they're able to actually distribute e-gift cards in the amount of $20. And there's lots of choices where folks can redeem those gift cards. So they can use them at like food delivery apps like Grubhub, they can use it at select grocery stores um, or at a number of different chain restaurants and they can select where they wanna utilize those. 
Um, we also plan to provide those for folks that are involved in our focus groups and our key format interviews for planning. Um, and in the future, when we shift from after publishing the plan, we're hoping to build out um, a task force for um, harm reduction and we'll compensate people similarly for their time um, involved in that task force as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to pose um, maybe like a final question to you guys. Um, but I was thinking about like either what ways do you feel that your um, your department can better support SSPs, but also like what feedback have you gotten from SSPs in your state about ways they can be better supported or feedback from, from people who use drugs uh, or participants of programs or folks who work at these programs um, that they would like to see or need from, from the state to be better supported. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Jump on in there, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might as well, hey, it's just the theme. I'll, I'll just go first. Um, so I will say that um, our SSP, our quarterly calls um, that we host, um, that I mentioned during my presentation, um, that really brings together all of our SSPs, really provides um, an outlet for them to provide us with any type of feedback that they may have, um, whether that may be um, how they're operating, especially with COVID um, and like funding restrictions, um, you know, how they, because we all know, I know, um, you know, operating an SSP um, takes a lot of creativity. <laughs> um to be sustainable um and so we've really just made sure um that we ask for their feedback all the time and provide um evaluations also and then um along the same lines our ssps also frequently um ask their client or provide evaluations internally or like program programmatically um, and then they send their feedback to us and um, just to see like what their, um, you know, participants would really like to see happening within the, within the programs. Is there anything that like jumps out at you um, in terms of feedback that you guys have gotten that they would like to see? I realize I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> No, it's okay. It's okay. It was no, no worries. Um, I don't think so. And Meredith, I, I know she's on the call. I don't want to put you on the spot because I know we we talk so much. Is there anything that stands out to you necessarily? Because yeah, I mean, I I think it's tricky because while we ask for feedback constantly, we can't always address it because like we hear things like you know, your application process is like a little too cumbersome or, you know, we're running out of supplies that we can't fund them, right? And so there's like, if there are certain, like a lot of their primary challenges are things that we necessarily can't address because of the way the legislation is written. Um, the zoning rules are still presenting, you know, some challenges and like really reaching people where they're at, right? And so, Sometimes we find ourselves just listening and trying to just yeah. say like, we hear you, you know, you're doing your best, but then there are other things that we can address, right? And things like how, you know, operationalizing testing and like incorporating other services. And that's where there's like a great opportunity for like the peer-to-peer -peer exchange that often happens or needs for trainings. And we can always like help out with trainings and things like that um, and just getting creative and like, how do we shift the funding that we do have yeah. to make sure that they are able to like, you know, maximize the resources that we are providing. So like, it's definitely a balance of like trying to help out where we can, but then also understand mm -hmm. that they're still kind of tied up in other ways. And I think just looping back to ETS, that's where that really comes in 
Um, and those voices are really important to document because when we put together this, you know, more comprehensive strategic plan, getting that in writing and have the strategies and ideas like down that we can really share at all levels, right, at the community, but also like up to different sort of state um, leaders, like that will be essential. So we're always listening, although we can't always act, which is frustrating. Yeah, no, and to piggyback off of that, and I know we're already running on time, but um, to bring at this point, um, you know, our application process can seem cumbersome um, to agencies and we have worked um, really closely together within our program to hopefully better streamline and make it a simple, uh, a more simple process. And so as we, to, again, to Mary's point, like sometimes we can only just listen, but we also kind of sit back and try to be strategic as to how we can make it more simple for our agencies. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, I know we're like a minute or two past time, uh, so I do wanna be respectful of folks' time. I just wanted um, Sally and Amy, if you had anything to, to close out with or final thoughts. I'm just excited to see our program kick off, to see what it does, to maybe get to reach out uh, to some more people if we can't encounter any issues. I'm glad that I have NASTAD and a whole other group of folks from the United States around to help with this and anything that we may encounter. And um, I'm just hoping for a smooth kickoff. Yeah, no, I think it's exciting to hear from each other and hear what different challenges and strengths we all have with trying to do more to support SSPs. So. Well, thank you guys so much for um, attending and uh, participating, for, for everybody who attended, for our wonderful panelists, for sharing uh, experiences from your guys' estates. Uh, I do apologize that we went a few minutes over, but um, I hope folks enjoyed this session. Um, so there's about a now 12 minute break. Um, and then our closing plenary for the SSP Institute today will be from 315 to 430 um, around community grief, mourning and self care. So really encourage folks to tune into that as well. Um, so thank you guys so much and hope to see you in our next session and chat soon. Thanks, everyone.